Thank you very thank you very much everyone i'm actually not going to talk very much about strips and white flowers and entomology and things like that today ipm academy is an in-service training for uf ISIS extension agents that several of us were involved in offering over a three-year period i'm going to talk about that i'm also going to talk about um processes leading up to that but um first of all i just want to ask everyone a quick question Raise your hand if you don't shout out, but raise your hand if you know what that says. And I raise your hand if you don't know what it says. You don't know what it says. Um, so I'm using a traffic sign to make two pretty simple points. The first, hopefully you all know that that says stop, right? <laughs> The first is the, that transition from not really knowing what's going on to complete clarity of, okay, I get it, or what I refer to as a light bulb moment, which is very important when you're designing the sort of trainings that I'm gonna be talking about with IPM Academy, where we were developed training in entomology and pest management for a group of what I'm calling non-specialists or people who don't really have that background, okay? So you really have to think about what is a reasonable amount of material that you can offer in a training of 40 minutes, three hours a day, whatever you might happen to have, in order to get those, those moments of clarity so that people are comfortable and confident with what they do. The other, and when we started planning the first IPM Academy in 2019, initially we spent almost as much time talking about what we were not going to try to teach as what we were gonna to try to teach, okay? So the other point that I wanna talk about has to do with the relationship between words and signs, or specifically words and images. As academics, we like words. Words are useful for explaining things. Words are also very useful for concealing things. That is less easy to get away with with images. And without getting overly philosophical, it is partly our ability to create images in our head that enables us to think, and our ability to recall and retain these images that enables us to, to remember. So when if you've ever been trying to figure out something really difficult, you really think about something really hard, you probably weren't using words. You were probably setting images off against each other, because that's just kind of the way we think. If you're trying to develop a lot, uh, pro offer a lot of specialized information, say about entomology management to a group that doesn't have a lot of background, it is more efficient and more effective to use visual and narrative material than to put a bunch of words up on it. So here's another kind of simple example. Here's a poster. You can all understand the message in this. You all understand what this means. Okay? There are very few words in this poster. The words are all in Vietnamese. You don't have to be able to read Vietnamese or anything to understand what this poster is about. Uh, if this poster were placed with bullet points in English about how to manage mosquito-borne disease, it would not be as interesting as this. There's, images have kind of a narrative quality that engage the audience and draw them in. So what I just said about words and images is also holds true for numbers and images. Uh, there's a lot of interest in pest management about the relationship between polyculture or crop diversity and managing pests. 
This is from uh, David Ando's review article of 1991. He did a review of the literature seeing how often polyculture reduced pet standards. And not surprisingly, it was related to the host range of the, of the arthropod in question. So in this, uh, in this graph, the red columns are monophagous arthropods, ones with a narrow host range, and all the orange columns add up to 100. The blue columns are for polyphagous arthropods or, or with a broad host range, and um, they also add up to 100. So you can see the number of studies where the response was variable is kind of similar. The number of studies where polyculture actually increased the number of pests was much more, uh, happened much more often when the pests had a broad host range. That makes sense if you're adapted to take advantage of a lot of different botanical families, having a variety of different uh, crops as might be uh, advantageous for you. The number of studies where there was no change was similar for the both types. However, it, looking at the studies where polyculture reduced pest damage, it was much more likely to reduce pest damage if the arthropod had a narrow host range if it was monophagous than if it was polyphagous. And that also makes sense. If you're a pig eater and you're confronted with a lot of crops that you can't deal with, it makes sense that that would undermine your performance. But that's not the point that I want to make with this slide. This is the point that I want to make with this slide. This is exactly the same information, but just told with numbers. And I could say, well, you can clearly see in the slide that polyculture reduces pest damage more with monophagous pests than polyphagous pests. But you can't really clearly see anything. It doesn't really, it doesn't really jump out at you like a stop sign the way it just does it. This is just kind of the basics of how to give a presentation. But the point is, it's, this is easier to, it, to present. It's, you, it takes more work to go ahead and make something that is graphically engaging and more easily digestible, but um, it's more efficient and it's more I first became interested in participative and interactive teaching uh, 20 years ago um, in the spring of 2003. I took a month-long course in teaching English to adults in Hanoi, Vietnam. And I didn't take this picture. I just lifted this from the web uh, the other week, but I'm pretty sure this is the same place I studied. So we had to actually come up with activities, games, create situations where the students actually had to use the topic of the day, the whatever was being studied that day. So say we were working on prepositions, we might have to create a, a, a treasure hunt with a map so the students would have to use prepositions and give uh, directions to each other. Something else that I became, uh, became uh, exposed during that spring of Vietnam is farmer field scan methodology. These are the covers for two manuals for farmer field school. A farmer field school methodology is an approach to interacting with low resource growers, usually in the tropics, usually growers with limited or no education. Um, and it's a way to engage them in on-farm uh, research. So maybe every two weeks, a group of farmers would meet and look at one field that's receiving some experimental nutrition regime and compare them to something that's traditionally used. Or maybe they're, you're comparing uh, different types of weed management. This uh, field guide over here on the left describes pest management, and there, there's a, an activity in, in that field guide where the growers will actually create pages in order to figure out, if, uh, answer the question, are the arthropods in their fields, um, is this a pest or is it beneficial if you have something unknown? So you might uh, create a cage, put in something that's a known pest, and then put in another arthropod that you're not sure about, and just observe it and see does it act like a predator or not. So it's observational-based learning. Um, all ecosystem analysis is another part of farmer field school methodology. You're not just looking at the field, you're looking at the weeds, you're looking at the forest, you're looking at you know, what's going on with your neighbor, what's going on seasonally. But the most important concept for me and that I carried over into IPM Academy and working with extension agents is this idea of creating local experts. So growers are very focused on the specifics of their field. They need to learn how to be successful in their fields. It doesn't matter how that crop is grown on the other side. And there's a sort of a similarity with extension agents who are assigned uh, a county or a group of plants. And they're usually working on very specific commodities or a group of plants. They might say be working with nursery growers around Orlando or, or pepper growers in Palm Beach County. Extension agents are generalists, okay? They're not just working in pest management, they're working with diseases and variety trials. And increasingly they're working on pest management practices. So they don't need to know everything that we know as entomologists. And it's a mistake to try to teach them everything. They need that slice of what we know that is useful for them to do what they need to do to serve their stakeholders. While I was in Vietnam that spring, I learned that I had been awarded a Fulbright to teach pest management at the Universidad de Valle in Guatemala. Uh, this is the class during one of the field trips. And I applied to teach a regular semester long class with 40 minute 
uh, lectures and a, and a lab, but that wasn't how it was taught at this university. It's an eight week intensive summer course. So I was given three hour blocks of time to teach this class and I'd never taught it before. I was teaching it for the first time and I was teaching it in Spanish or at least my version of Spanish. And it was very useful for me to have come out of the class uh, the one in Vietnam, which was focused on interactive participative teaching. So I could break up those three hour blocks of time with, with sections just to, to make the class a little more manageable. After that, I worked on the Central Coast of California for a number of years, and I was able to continue working with uh, Hispanic uh, agricultural communities. And one of the first activities that I came up that I was considered kind of successful was an outreach activity was getting people to sort pests into good groups of good bugs and bad bugs. So the first thing I did, I printed out a bunch of images of insects, glued them to poster board, made a couple uh, sets. So just imagine that I've broken you guys all up into groups and I've jumbled these all up and I'm telling you to sort these into good bugs and bad bugs, okay? So let's just randomly take four cards. And some of you can see what's going on here. Some of you are looking at these and saying, okay, I think I kind of, I kind of this is reminding me of something. So this picture up here on the top left clearly has the most information about what we're looking at. So I just want to ask the students in the room, which, which insect order are we looking at here? It's different, right. So it's a wasp mimic, but it's clearly different. What about this one down here in the lower right? Hopefully some of you have taken immatures. There's some hints in there. There's aphids in there, and there's an aphid on the end of its stylus. Okay, anybody in the room call out and tell me what we're looking at here. Dipter, okay. So, in fact, this is uh, the life cycle of, this is a serpent. This is a type of fly that as an adult feeds on floral resources. Uh, not all serpids are specialists in aphids, but most of them are. This is its egg blown up much larger than you would ever see it, and there's the pupil. So this is the life, this is the life cycle of, of a serpent, which are, these are important for regulating populations, particularly of aphids. So let's grab another random four cards. Some of you can see where I'm going with this. Everybody knows what this is on the lower left, right? Uh, okay, what about this? Anybody, can anybody tell me what we're looking at here? Lady beetle larva. Lady beetle larva, right. Do all lady beetle larvae look like that? No. No, right. Some of them are white, have like white uh, waxy protuberances on their back and some lady, lady beetle larvae look like uh, mealybugs. You kind of have to turn them over and look at the mouth to be sure that it, whether it's a pest or a beneficial. Okay, here's the egg cluster. Are there any pests that have, uh, this is obviously a life cycle of a toxin or a lady beetle larva. Are there, an egg, are there any pests that produce an egg cluster like that? Yes. Huh? Where? You said yes. Almost. I mean, they're a different color. What, which one? Uh, the false color of the beetle. It's like a pressing of an egg. Okay, good. There's also uh, a Pierre that, that's a pest of brassicas that has egg clusters that look a lot like that. And I have to bring them in and rear them, let them hatch to see what I've got. Okay, so some of these could be confused. Okay, last one. Anybody just call out and tell me what we're looking at here. Green lace one. Right, we've got the life cycle of green lace one. Here's the eggs, larvae. This is actually a brown lace wing, pupa, I think, but it was the best I could do at the time. So, who in this room knows more about identifying insects than anyone? In fact, he knows more than anyone in the state. Who in this room? Lyle. Lyle. <laughs> okay. Said three times, anybody call out? Anybody call out? Did Lyle ever call out? No. Now, if I broke you up into groups, if you were working in a group, the, the more knowledgeable student, or in this case, the state expert, would take on a leadership role. And the less knowledgeable people, people who are less comfortable would feel more comfortable saying, okay, I don't know what this is. So that is something that's really interesting about creating group activities is when I do this and you can kind of circulate and you can see who knows more, who knows less, what's the overall knowledge level of the group. And it's kind of like an ongoing needs assessment when you have interactive activities. When you're just standing and talking at people, you have no idea how much of what you're saying is actually going in. Sorry for using you as a prop here. I was depending on you to be here. Um, it was for pedagogic purposes. So the, the thing I asked was, good, which are good and which are bad? Okay, we didn't look at absolutely every single one of them, but were there any bad bugs? There weren't. Everything in the activity, they're all beneficial insects, okay? 
So that's kind of the shtick, but that was the kind of thing with the activity. It's, it's not just teaching identification of beneficials, it's in teaching the importance of knowing how to identify any arthropod of importance in all of its different life stages, okay? Some of them are more obscure than others, but you need to be able to identify it. If you're gonna be involved in managing pests or beneficials, you need to be able to identify them in all their different life stages, which means you need to know what sort of metamorphosis they have, right? So these are some of the fundamental things that you need to know. All right, so identification of the pests is the first step in pest management. This is really challenging with a group that's very different in Florida, which are thrips, okay? because they're, they're tiny and they have to be slide mounted. They have microscopic features that you have to be slide mounted in order to be identified to species. How do you make something like that accessible to the non special and why, you know, why does it matter? Um, well, with, with thrips, at least in South Florida, you're always dealing with a, dealing with a species. Complex. You're always dealing with a mixture. Say if you're working in tomato, strawberry, pepper, what have you, you're always dealing with half a dozen or so species of which maybe three or four are the most common and the most important. Um, but they do vary in terms of pest importance by species. Some species are more damaging. Some are better vectors of, so you're right, I am actually talking about this a little bit. Some are actually vectors <laughs> of disease more efficient vectors of disease, some are more susceptible insecticides, some are more likely to develop resistance. So you really, if you're dealing with strips in Florida, you need to know what new species you have in the mix. Um, so I always found that it, they became a problem in, in, in Central Florida in 2013, 2014, in a lot of crops, the focus was on strawberry, and I had to learn how to identify strips. Now, I always found this kind of difficult and intimidating. When, when you have to learn how to identify a group to species, what's the first thing that you're given? What's the first thing people direct you to when you have to learn to identify it to species? A key. a key, dichotomous keys, right? I believe very strongly that dichotomous keys are for people who already know what they're looking at. I find them, you, you are given this very specific specialized terminology of the different morphology of the insect that you're dealing with. So with thrips, it's like CD and microtracheal foams. And with thrips, it wasn't, I, it wasn't just that I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't know where I was looking for, okay? So I had a student who developed a series, uh, Jeff Cleaver developed a series of EDIF articles, these quick guides, which are available. And you can see it's like a map of the thrips. It shows you what you're looking for, but also exactly where you're looking for. It. And um, these uh, have been very useful for trainings within my lab and, and, and outside of the lab, they, they do ha have some errors in them and we're in the process of redoing them. Um, but anyway, they've been, they have been very useful. Um, we've used these for a series of trainings going back to 2015. In 2015, um, Amanda Hodges and I were involved in putting on uh, a group of trainings on management and identification of thrips. And when we started, having the phone calls to plan the content and the delivery, um, Joe Funderburg said, if you're gonna teach strips identification, you need to put it at the end because everyone's gonna walk out. And I remember thinking, hmm, and we did put it at the end, but not because we expected everyone to walk out. So the first question is, you know, how do you get to those light bulb moments? When you have something as arcane and difficult as strips identification, it's on a slide, right? How do you, how do you make sure that people are going to be confident and clear by the end of it? So we, we decided to focus on four common species. We were just going to make sure, I think we had an hour for ID. We were going to make sure that people were comfortable with four species. So I started off showing slides of the different characteristics that we were going to focus on. And then after that, there was this hands-on activity that was created by, this is Nicole Casusa, who was a DTM student at the time. You can see had these large laminated sheets with sort of a template of a thrip. So it's like an archetypal thrips on it, with little Velcro squares. And there were different characters that were all laminated that were kind of mixed up. Um, and the group had to assemble the right characters for the four species that we were focusing on. And you can see it was a little chaotic, but people were having fun. And that, that is not typically a word associated with learning how to identify thrips for the first time. But then after that, um, I went back and I showed the, the slide, an actual slide connected to the computer up on the screen. And I showed the process I went through to identify what I had. And I, I, I was saying that, so the first thing I look at is the form. You see the solid line here of CD or hairs. That tells me that I'm looking at Franklin yellow. 
okay, I was doing this uh, in South Florida at a center in South Florida, and somebody in the front row interrupted me at this point in real time, just like this, trying to teach 30 people, and corrected me and said, that character is not specific to Franklin Yellow. That is like a family characteristic, which was true, but completely irrelevant for what I was trying to do. So I just repeated what the person said and then continued. And I was actually grateful to them later on for providing me with something of a light bulb moment, which was the realization that I was not trying to teach strip taxonomy. I was trying to teach useful, okay? The people who were at this meeting, they were dealing with strips and peppers, strawberries, tomato. They wanted to know, do I have Florida flower thrips? The native thrips, which is only damaging under really unusual circumstances, under high numbers. Or do I have one of the other more problematic species, which are more commonly referred to as invasive? invasive. And once I start to spray, am I reducing numbers of the more problematic ones, or am I knocking out the native thrips and selecting for the more problematic ones? So um, that's why people were there. And this is an important point, and I hope you will all forgive me for making it. But if you want to make IPM or anything accessible to the non-specialists, you really need to stay focused on the idea of creating a local expert. What do you know that they as a non-specialist need to know in order to do what they need to do? It's very tempting to get distracted and start impressing on people how clever we are and to start presenting information that is not useful to the group because it's not information that the group can use, right? That's when people walk out of your thrips idea. Gene McAvoy came up to me at the end of the one in Amakwa and he said he'd been coming to these for years, but this is the first time that he really got it. So what did we do differently? We focused on visual patterns, first kind of larger than life on the big screen. And then in Nicole's activity where the, the, the people I had actually assembled, those visual patterns that make the trips, the chili trips, the melon trips, the melon trips, and so on. And only after people were comfortable at that point did we go to the microscopes and everything that's involved in looking at things under a microscope. At no point did the terminology matter. I'm not saying terminology doesn't matter. Clearly, it's essential. But if you're dealing with a non-specialist audience and you lead with terminology or focus on terminology at the expense of visual, and net, um, it, it can be kind of productive. OK. Every two years, the University of Florida puts on an extension symposium for agents and for extension faculty. And at the end of the one in 2017, there was a lot of concern expressed apparently by a number of agents the inadequacy of pest management materials. Specifically, a lot of agents said they would be with stakeholders, growers at a, what have you, a nursery or farm and the, the, the person had a pest problem and they didn't know what to tell the person what to spray. They felt that this information should be in EDIS. There was also some confusion about uh, locating us extension specialists. And there were various responses to this, one of which was that we ended up offering IPM Academy. But before we get to IPM Academy, just let me ask all of you, is that the first question that an agent should be asking? Like, what do we spray? Is that the, from an IPM perspective, is that the first question that an agent should be asking? It shouldn't be, but generally it is. <laughs> exactly. It shouldn't be, but generally it is. It's actually one of the last questions. Okay, but that dichotomy is what informed the creation of IPM Academy. We wanted to create this training to prepare agents to respond. Wait, but you can see, though, because you go to the doctor, you know, what's wrong with me? What pills should I take, right? I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, and so, but the doctor says, oh, yeah, you've got this. And you will, what should I take? You know, that, and, and so. Uh, That's right. And, and what she takes is probably more important about the diseases from the end well, user standpoint. You know what I'm saying? Right. I don't care if I have this texture. That this is what kind of antibiotic I should take to kill it. Right? But if you're eating bacon three times a day, does it matter what cholesterol medication you're taking? Okay. So true. there is. There is right, I understand right. what you're saying. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but there's a broader. There's. A, we were trying to get at a broader training. Uh, that's that's my point. Right. The point well taken. No, no, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I just. Uh, oh, you're agreeing with me? Oh yeah. What, what do you What do you sound like when you're disagreeing with me? Frustrating. You know, because they want to know, well, why did I tell these people to, you know? No, it's, and, it's, and, and, and it's extensions, but it seems we're not very good at giving. No, them. you need to know, and I do a lot of insecticide work, and you need to have that information, but, but anyway. Um, so this was a flyer for the first uh, IPM Academy, which was a day-long affair. It took several months of planning. It was at Citra. This was before COVID. It was in person back, you know, in person wasn't even anything that we were saying all the time. Um, so uh, Norm Lepla gave the welcoming remarks, uh, gave an, a brief overview of key development of IPM, both globally and also in Florida. It was a 
great foundation to training. He did this three years in a row, and Norm was also involved in directing some of the uh, the, the needs assessments that we did each of the three years, starting off the first year. Then Lauren Diepenfrog gave a very engaging overview of the fundamentals of IPM. It's kind of an introduction to what people were going to be dealing with uh, in, in learning hands-on during, during the training. And you can see that this was also turned into a module that I'll get to in a little bit later. Then, then we got into the hands-on part. And Adam Dale created this great hands-on activity, again, focusing on the visual, associating damage with mouth parts with types of arthropods. This is really the first thing you're dealing with when you're, you're, you find a plant that's got some damage on it. Sometimes you don't even find the arthropod. It's cryptic or it's nocturnal or whatever the grower spray got rid of it. And I remember the first time we did this, um, we lost power and we had to go into the lobby and Adam didn't miss a beat. We just, he just got right into it. We had to go out and use natural light. That was a great beginning foundation to the training. Uh, Daniel Carrillo was supposed to give a training on biological control, and Daniel was instrumental to the success of all three years, but Ironic never was involved personally, um, physically present. So uh, September 19th, 2019 was the day of the first IPM Academy, and it ended up being this, the, the day his interview to become a U.S. citizen was scheduled. So Daniel chose wisely. He went to the interview. So we lost uh, a great Teaching only gained a great American, so that was good. Lorena Lopez, who was postdoc in Oxford a lot of the time, stepped in and took over the biocontrol session. And she did this great hands on session with ordering uh, commercial biocontrol agents in cans and uh, showing them and actually hooking up the microscope to the screen so they could actually see the predatory mites running after the spider mites. It was reminiscent of that farmer field school activity I mentioned, where you're actually observing the predators doing their thing. And uh, Silvana um, gave uh, an overview of resistance management, but she didn't just provide basics of resistance management. She actually provided resources that are available on the internet for agents to use to get more information about the specifics of the crops they're dealing with, the insects, the commodities. Um, and then um, Triyanka Lahiri gave, uh, ran a needs assessment, and, um, which we did each year. Adam, you can't see Adam. Adam was off to the left writing notes on those big two foot high post-it notes, which are still rolled up in my office. I need to, need to get back to them. But, um, and, and then there were some, there were breakout sessions and I'm just gonna spend a moment and describe one that I developed, which gets back to this 2017 question of, um, you know, what do I spray? So I created a kind of a board game to, to deal with this question. And I, I don't know how well you can see this, but there's, it's, it's organized around the phenology of a tomato going from transplant up to fruiting. And when someone calls me up and say, well, we've got aphids on X, you know, what, you know, what, what should be sprayed? The first question I ask is what's the state of the crop? I mean, was it just planted or is it getting ready to be harvested? So there's a bunch of fundamental questions you ask before you ask what to spray or even if, you know, if you should spray and what you should spray. So um, you can also see that there, there was a list of several pests that went along the bottom of it. And there was a, a die. One dice is a die, right? Okay, sure. so there was a die. So you roll the die until your die comes up three. So then there's a box of pests. You pick out the top one, leaf miners. Okay, week three, we had a leaf miner infestation. Then there's another box with a bunch of, these are insecticides. So I had these sort of reader digest version of insecticide labels. Insecticide labels are usually about 30 pages. But I made these cards that had the mode of action, which is the most important information for resistance management, what are the pests, PHI, pollinator uh, warning, things like that. So they would sort through these to, to, to determine, okay, what can we use for leaf miners and make a decision. I um, mean, you can also see there's squares here, which are blocking out treatment intervals related to resistance management. I'm, I'm not gonna say a lot more about that, but um, you do wanna group modes of action by treatment interval in order to not overuse uh, certain insecticides. So that was part, part of this activity. Okay, then they roll the die again. Week six, pick out another pest. Okay, white flies, we have, we have a white fly infestation week six. Oh, but in week six, the crop is flowering, so we have to take pollinators into account. Then you're looking through the different cards that you can use for white flies, taking these various things into account. What do we, we sprayed mode of action 28 for the leaf miner. We don't want to use that again for white flies because we're in another uh, treatment interval. So it was, it was an activity to pull in an actual situation to make season-long decisions related to pest management. 
um, to, so it doesn't tell you what to spray, but it kind of was supposed to emphasize the different things to think about. Um, there were various other hands-on activities. It was pretty successful the first time, showing you some pictures from some of the other hands-on activities. There was interest expressed in making collections, and this developed into uh, field the lab sessions that we emphasize in the future. Future IP and Academy. So it was quite successful. So we started planning in the beginning of 2020 to do it again. We were going to do a, a day-long thing. Um, and then COVID happened. And as the, the day was approaching, or the session was approaching, it became clear we were going to have to do it all on Zoom. And so we've been planning a day-long thing. And I'm, I'm, we were involved in one of these planning sessions. And I'm starting to figure out how to do an eight-hour Zoom session. And Daniel Carrillo says, you, people can't spend eight hours on Zoom which is pretty obvious when somebody said it. So we decided then to reduce it to four hours, just the participative group stuff, and to add a pre-course to go over the basics so when people came in, they would have them. That's what we did. Adam created this, this module um, for, a, for a course for people to take before the actual training on you know, mouth parts, metamorphosis, um, fundamental entomology that you need for pest management. Daniel Carrillo created a module on biological control, predators, parasitoids, uh, pathogens, different types of you know, augmentative concentration biocontrol. Julian Buzelin uh, did something on fundamental uh, specs or information about insecticides. And we paired that with, you know, I did characteristics of insecticides. So Julian's and my module uh, presentations together formed modules. So there were three modules that were a course everyone had to take for the in-service training in order to get credit for the in-service training. So then in the actual day, this was all on Zoom, so the different instructors could, uh, were focusing on still the lab, I guess. So Sri Anka Lahiri focused on thrips and other cryptic pests. Silvana, Apollo Marais focused on the doctor and soft bodied insects. Duad Karachi joined us uh, from Immokalee and working with white flies and white fly parasitoids. And Lorena Lopez did a section comparing beneficial uh, or predatory extinct bugs to testing bugs. And then after that, the students were grouped and went through different breakout rooms to focus on specific pest management scenarios uh, as, as teams. So Xavier Martini from Quincy created a, a pest problem in vegetables. Adam created one in turf. And Lauren Diepenbrock and Silvana uh, created one with a new invasive snail. So the groups had to go spend about 20, 25 minutes in each breakout room. There was a scenario they determine, you know, what's what's the priority? Like with invasives, usually the first thing is making sure you got it identified properly. In some of these scenarios, there was um, reasons that you could not use or would not want to use insecticides. So what are your alternatives to insecticides? In other ones, they would need to be making choices about insecticides. So the point of these breakout sessions was for the group function as teams and, and engage in that collaborative detective work of solving growers' problems, which is what IPM is all about. Lessons from 2020. As interesting as that was, it didn't really make a lot of sense for the turf and ornamental people to talk about a tomato problem and vice versa. We decided to separate them. We decided the third year in 2021 when we did this, we were going to add a naturology section. And we were going to add a pollinator section. So the last time we did this, it was in person. It was back in uh, etc. It was a day-long affair, took many months of planning. This is the poster that greeted people when they came in. And so people were actually being spread out with a field lab. So Sri Lanka could start off with a cage with thrips in it so that agents could actually aspirate the thrips, knock them out, get them in a vial, look at them under the microscope. And at the end of the table, there's the actual sheet, the form you fill out to submit the, the sample for identification. And Silvana was able to focus hands-on Rearing with lepidopters. Caterpillars are very hard to ID as larvae. Sometimes you have to rear them to adulthood to know what you've got. And uh, also, you might want to, if you want to do back, get background information on parasitism, you need to rear, you need to rear the insects out. So uh, that was that was part of what Salvani was doing. And Jawad was uh, had his white flies and white fly parasitoids. Uh, Xavier Martini had a, a table on monitoring and trapping, but he was not able to send me a picture. Uh, and then there were new additions to this. Alexander Ravinti had uh, came up from Homestead to offer a section on recognizing mites and their damage. And from a pest management perspective, mites are every bit as important as this. And Alexander also added a module to the pre-course. We did the pre-course again um, with the original three modules plus this. 
And we all, were also able to include Rachel Mallinger. We had an outside section there. We were able to visit a lot of different flowering plants and look at actual live pollinators. She had a display because pollinator health, pollinator concerns are integral to the proper delivery of IPM. That was a great addition. And Rachel also created a module um, that was also part of the pre course. Uh, Julian had this kind of game show, um, what's the best insecticide to use, which was very entertaining, very educational. Uh, there was a time constraint. I think there was a loud buzzer involved, but um, that was fun. And then at the end of the day, again, we broke up into sections, turf and ornamental one by uh, Adam and Alexandra, and there was a vegetable and field one that, that Julian and I ran with help from Norm, who I think was bouncing back and forth between um, so this was one of the more many good things that came out of this whole process. I think increased communication amongst faculty across commodities across um, sub districts. You know, Florida is this very rich mosaic of different types of farming systems. You've got nurseries next to vegetable fields, next to citrus, and the growers may not talk to each other. But if they're spraying X or what, what they're doing to treat insects on one farm, it certainly influences the, the success of what's going to happen on an adjacent farm. So that, that was something that came out of this. Uh, we also uh, produced a, a, an EDIS article that kind of goes back to that 2017 complaint. It doesn't tell you what to spray, but again, it's a discussion of um, modes of action and resistance management across the diversity of commodities in Florida that Adam and Julian and I wrote. And uh, one thing that I don't really like about it is that we created this table. This is just the first page, but this is all the, the insecticides that are commonly used in Florida, horticulture, turf, you name it. And we've got a column that has the strict names for vegetables and field and another one for turf and ornamental. So this is actually very useful for sort of translating and communicating across, across disciplines. Um, so IPM Academy was successful in part because we functioned as a statewide team from Homestead to Jay. And I deliberately recruited assistant professors for this project. The project came out of discussions I had with uh, Saka Mukhtar back in 2018 about working with assistant professors on helping them develop a set extension programs. I found expectations for extension very mystifying as an uh, assistant professor. I, I still, I'm not going to say I find it any less mystifying now, but uh, Satyab was very helpful at the time of my three-year review, and he referred me to Matt Binge. Uh, I had a meeting with Matt in his office. Matt is currently the interim director for PDEC. Um, there was a follow-up Zoom meeting in 2018 with Xavier, Lauren, Julian, and me, and that was when IPM Academy was first discussed, and IPM Academy was actually Matt Binge's idea. Uh, and uh, Blair Siegfried nominated us for an award. We got an award, and we won the IPM Educator Award. And so the end result is, let's see if this is, do you want to help me? See if we can so the end result is that there is now a seven module training in Canvas for UF, UF IFAS extension agents called Fundamentals of Managing Art for Podcasts. So, um, and you can see, you can actually see, you can see the modules down there. There's Lauren's module, Adam's module, Julian's and my module on insecticides and Rachel's on pollinators. Alexander's on mites and Daniel's on biological control. And though this is called Fundamentals of Managing Art for Podcasts, I would welcome 25 minute module from our nematologists on, you know, nematodes, why are they important to all the commodities in Florida? Five minute video on how to take a core sample, information on where to get things identified. I think that would be, that would be very useful. Um, so, you know, this is something agents can take at their leisure. New agents can use it for onboarding. Established agents can use it for a refresher. And while uh, Daniel Mainwaring of the Center for Online Training, or Colt, was helping me, he pulled this together for us. I'm very grateful to Barbara Larson. Uh, Daniel said, well, this is good, but there's kind of static. There's no, there's no opportunity for feedback. So last year, I reached out to everyone with an IPM, entomology and nematology, and all the pollinator people in our department. And I asked you all for a blurb on yourselves. And uh, so that's down here. Yeah, so um, this is, well, actually, actually, let me just show you. It's, it's, I don't know, it's pretty much, it should, it should have everyone, but 
I wouldn't, so I should have this about everyone, but I actually wouldn't be surprised if between the time I started talking and now the, the department has hired someone else because they hire people pretty quickly around here, but there's a, there's a little blurb on everyone and an agent can scroll through and see who does what. And um, say they, they are interested in what Brian does. They just, Brian Botter, they just click on his name and it takes them to his web page. So this isn't reinventing the wheel, it's just presenting IPM pollinator people as a team. And I actually, this is something that I talked to Blair about five years ago. My only reservation is it's kind of buried in this ISP that may or may not got a lot of traffic, but I think this would be you know, something good for us to have on our main web page. And you know, Blair liked the idea, not just of, for IPM, but we have a lot of teams. You know, we, we've got, we are the most diverse department, uh, you know, in the, on the planet, actually, in terms of, we are real rich in terms of all the subdisciplines are represented, we, you know, the mosquito team, urban teams, um, and this is obviously beyond the scope of what I'm talking about, but just from a perspective of recruiting, we're all interested in recruiting good students, um, and, you know, we're, we're, our department is pretty unique. There's no other department on the planet like, like this department in terms of richness and diversity. So we could probably do a better job of promoting that. Uh, on our med web, main, main web page. But as I say, that, that's, that's a tough conversation. So uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, if there's time for questions, I will be happy to try to answer. So time for questions. And if you're on Zoom, feel free to type a question into the chat box or raise your hand. Any questions? Adam, yes. Um, I think one thing that a lot of these efforts also addressed is that, as you said, the, the county agents are generalists. So you have agents working in tomatoes and working in turf and ornamentals. And I think something that these efforts addressed was the, the difference between these perennial crop systems and these annual or very short-lived cropping systems and how IPM is very different between those two. I think I think it made a big difference for agents to really understand that. Right. So if people in Zoom, if they could hear Adam was pointing out that we did emphasize how it's a, you need to characterize a cropping system, the annual system, something that's in the ground for three months, it's the options for pest management are very different for something that's a permanent part of the landscape and, and something in between. So yeah, I mean, we actually had a really interesting time characterized all those different aspects of the way things are grown in Florida because it's incredibly diverse as a state, amazingly diverse. Dan. So I like that you have paired these pre-courses with your in-person course now. Do you feel that the pre-courses are used by the people who are coming to the in-person course? Do they enhance the opportunity? What has really changed there? Because it was almost like you went online due to the pandemic, but now this may or may not be an extra benefit. And I realize that, unfortunately, this also co-varies with the number of times you've taught it. So of course you get better every time you teach it. Do you think this is something that's necessary for the people to come to the physical hands-on course? Or do you, do you use it as a supplement for folks? Well, the thing is people come into these, come into these trains with a real range of experience. And some people, might find some things redundant and other people are hearing it for the first time. I and mean, we would assume, what can you assume about an extension agent in terms of how much entomology they've had? Um, in some cases, they've maybe had close to none. So that was why we, we decided to, to maybe, maybe even went a little overboard by the last, you know, the third time we did it yesterday, was a couple hours pre-course that they needed to take. But I don't think it would hurt I, I think it would enhance it to, the idea was to get as mo much out of the interactive aspect as possible for people to come in as prepared as possible and not be wondering what, you know, what's a piercing sucking mouth part as opposed to the chewing. We wanted to get beyond, but I don't, that's really a question for the agents and, and uh, it'd, be, it'd be worth following up and finding what they, what they felt about it. How are you evaluating the impact of this? And do you ask those kinds of questions to your agents? Well, there is, there is an evaluation. There are evaluations and they're, they've been overwhelmingly positive. 
there has not been, I mean, that's, there hasn't been follow-up since then about, but that's a good point. I mean, to reach out to some of these people, uh, you know, we've got the list, you know, did you, did this end up helping you in any way? We should probably do that. Uh, I was interested in the idea of creating local experts, and I don't really know that much about ICAM Academy, but I was wondering, like, who is it available to? Is it available to members of the community outside of the extension program? Um, and is there any interest in promoting it to more people in the community outside of agents? Well, it was designed for agents, and it's and it, there aren't presently, and that the this is for agents also. Um, and there aren't, we've done a lot of other, we have done other trainings that were for members of the public. We use a lot of master gardeners. So, uh, you know, these trainings do go on, but, um, what are you, are you thinking of something in particular? We're not necessarily planning on doing this again in this format, in, you know, in the near future, but we are, yeah, I mean, a lot of us are interested in, in trying to make this, this information available and usable usable to people. Um, yeah, I guess I was thinking of ways you could share it with other facets of the community that would definitely um, benefit from engaging like the Master Gardener program and other, I guess, even just directly grow, grower groups that would like to find this information without having to go through another person to get to it. Yeah, well, I think we do, we do interact with growers. We do, uh, you know, in, in our various programs and with Master Gardeners, there's a lot going on with Master Gardeners across the state. And I mean, I've been, it's not recently, but I've been asked, I know a lot of us have been asked. We do get asked to work with Master Gardeners. So that's a very strong program. Any other questions or any on Zoom? Okay, so you will be around. Uh, we can take a couple minutes and then regroup at the coffee hour.